All right, it's another Wednesday night. It's January the 3rd of the year 2024. Happy new part of a year. Yeah. I guess this is the first service of the new year. So, yeah, yeah, it is. So, first service of the new year. So, yep. Happy first service of the new year. There we go. That sounds better. Um, last year, we were looking at. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 15, but this is all one long passage. Uh, tonight we're going to look at 16, 17, and 18, but um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, uh, our scholar calls, On the Faithful Departed. And um, last week I had some people that I knew that were here, I knew wouldn't be here today. So uh, I do encourage you to guys catch that last video because... This is a passage I always do at a, at a graveside. I never teach on this passage unless I'm at a graveside, or now that we're going through this book. So um, there was a lot of good questions that happened after that. I wish I could record everything, but I can't. So, and I, I even knew some of the questions that were coming. I knew, I knew them, and sure enough, I got them, and I was ready. So praise God. So this week we're going to look at the rest of this. And uh, it's going to take us all through the Bible. I mean, check out the Bible tabs. I don't even think we're going to get to all of them. Some of them I might just tell you what the verse says, and we won't even look at it. You can look at it later. So, um, um, yeah, and then, of course, there's a lot in it that you can debate about. If you want to debate about it, go ahead. The only thing that matters is you know who Jesus is, and you're the ones who are, <laughs> who are in Christ. So if you're dead in Christ, we'll see you later. And if you're alive when Christ comes back, You'll be there before we do. We'll catch up. <laughs> so, yeah, however it happens. Yeah, so here we go. I'll go ahead and read uh, 16, 17, 18. We'll pray. Uh, we're going to pray for Mitch Surley. They do know they're going to do the procedure to take out the two masses on his back on the 22nd. They do know that, but they don't know what time yet. So, so we'll be praying for him, and, um, and then we'll be praying for uh, Marley, little Marley. Um, Andrea is normally here, but her, her littlest one is, is, is sick, so we'll pray for her. So here we go, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening that we can gather in a free country and worship you. And Lord, I thank you for the time of worship and, and uh, everything we have going on right here. And Lord, right now, as we look at your word that your Holy Spirit breathed out, Jesus, we can't thank you enough that you shed your blood so we can be in your presence and hear from the Spirit. And Lord, I just ask that you open this up to us and speak to us in our each individual situations. And Lord, we just plead your blood over Mitch Shirley. And Lord, I just ask that you give him and Rhonda peace. And Lord, we thank you that you are the great physician and you can make, make this procedure work where they're going to go in and take those masses that are pushing his disc around in his back, Lord. And you can make it work above and beyond what we can ask or think. And we speak to any other mass that's in his back, and we say shrivel up and be, do no harm in Jesus' name. And I plead your blood over Marley, Lord, and I thank you, Lord. You're not a respecter of person, so you'll heal, a, you'll heal a 10-year-old, Lord. We just ask that she'll be quickly healed and whole and well, and, Lord, that she'll recover from whatever this is. And, Lord, we also lift up the Duncans to you tonight, Lord. They're under the weather. So, Lord, we just ask that you give them supernatural Holy Spirit rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So here's the whole passage. Let me just go ahead and give you 13 uh, through 15, and then we'll go into 16 where we're at. In verse 13 it says, But I, I do not want you to be, I always say unaware. It sounds better. <laughs> sounds like I'm insulting people at a graveside. Ig ignorant, brethren. <laughs> Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. When we cover that, who are, who's the ones that have no hope? The people who don't have God. They don't have the hope that we have. For if, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even God will even bring 
with him those who sleep in Jesus. Right there's the gospel message. Right there, him rising from the dead is tied to us rising of the new life. And of course, we went to Romans 6 and looked at all that. And then he'll bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That's a, that's a clue there. Where are those who sleep in Jesus? They're with him, yeah. They're with him, yeah. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Well, what's that? Scripture, it's what you're reading. That we, that we who are alive and remain until the, uh, to the coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. Yeah, because they're already there. Here we go. <laughs> Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right. So... For the Lord himself will descend. Uh, Mounts translates it the same way. It's in the future tense, so take it as a promise. And it's in the middle voice. Yeah, the Lord's going to do it for himself. And then uh, the next action word is, yeah, from heaven with a shout of the voice of archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ. The next, the, 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 there's only two action words, will rise. So, that's also a verb. It's in the future tense, and it's in the middle voice. Well, who are these people? These are the people who got themselves in Christ. <laughs> They've gone before us. They accepted the Lord Jesus while they were living here on this earth, and now they're in him. So to me, the middle voice, I like it right there where it's at. Yep, they did it for themselves. Going on with the notes, it is the Lord himself. Do we know his name? Yeah, Jesus, who saves his people. So the Lord himself will save. He's had a reputation of doing this all the way back in Isaiah. So let's go all the way back. Let's go. We're so old school here, we're going to go old T. Good old Old Testament. I went so far back, I went to the other note in Isaiah. All right. Let's see if I can get there. 63. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I did have it marked. Look at that. Okay, 63, 9 says, In their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence uh, saved them. In his love and his pity he remembered them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. So, after you get past the, the 50s, a lot of this is talking about Jesus and, and what he's going to do. And... Um, and, uh, of course, this, if you read this section, he's talking about Jesus loving them, but them turning against them. Then Jesus becomes the enemy of them. And uh, just like our country, we've got a lot of problems right now because we've become the enemy of God. Hopefully we get back on the right side. But anyways, you can see that he is, he, he, what does he do? He, he, uh, he, he, he shares all their afflictions. Yeah. And, 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 and the angel of his presence saves them. Right there is where you could take the word angel as messenger. Was Jesus a messenger? Oh, yes, he was. It's another way to look at angel. You can look at it as messenger. All right, and then who saves his people? Is he known for doing that in the New Testament? Yeah, let's go to Acts. Acts 1.11. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? We're going to look at this twice. Into heaven. This same Jesus who was taken up from you. Keep that in mind. He was taken up from you into where? Heaven. Well, so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So he's going to save us. He's going to return. Amen. So here he descended from above. Where's that? That's in heaven, right? So if you go back to 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it says, and, and to wait for the Son of His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And then if we go over to uh, 2 Thessalonians, which is conveniently the next page on my Bible. Actually, yeah, one, one page over. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord... Um, 
Jesus is revealed from heaven, right? With his mighty angels. Hey, the angels are in play. There's some pretty cool stuff coming up. So anyways, Jesus comes down and saves. He's known for doing that. He's been prophesied that he's going to do that. And he did do that in the first advent, Merry Christmas, right? But then he's gonna, there's going to be a second coming. And this all lines up with the gospel accounts. Now this verse here, we're going to look at twice as well. This is Mark 13, uh, uh, 26. Okay. Almost there. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Keep that in mind. There's going to be a section where we're going to be looking at all sorts of clouds. Terminology. Clouds. With great power and glory. So that definitely lines up with that, a gospel account. It lines up with Matthew, which we'll touch on a little bit later here. But let's go over to Luke 17. 24. And it says, As for the lightning that flashes from one part of heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also will the Son of Man will be in his day. Sounds like something coming from above to the below. Did you guys see how that verse read? There's some debate about that. We'll talk about that when we get to the whole cloud thing. All right. We, and then he will give a commanding the, the NIV mounts and our scholar Bruce, the, the Greek scholar and also the Bible scholar, mounts and Bruce, they all like using the word command, a commanding shout. And if you look at that word, sure enough, it, it can mean that. So a commanding shout to the dead in Christ to rise. Hey, look, the book of John gets in this. John 5, 25. Now keep this verse in mind too. This verse is really interesting. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear his voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. But if you go on to 29, it says, And come forth who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Sounds like there's two resurrections and you want to be part of the first one. Keep that in mind. Stay tuned to that. Moving on. And with an archangel's voice. Well, what's good about an ar ar archangel's voice? It makes things happen. Now, I just want to let you guys know, these lists of scriptures I'm giving you are not exhaustive. We could, keep, we could do one whole Bible study on one of these sections. So, here's a couple of them. Let's go back to Isaiah. So, what are we looking at? Archangels in their voice. All right. Isaiah 27, 13. So it shall be in that day the, the great trumpet. Is there a trumpet in our text? Yeah, there is. Will be blown. They will come who are, uh, who are about to perish in the land of Assyria, and they, and they who are outcast in the land of Egypt. Oh, it goes on. And shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain. So... A trumpet alerts these people, right? So the voice of an archangel makes things happen with a trumpet of God. I should have read the rest of the notes. All right, going on to Joel. And like I said, I could have made one of just angel voices, and I could have just done one of, of, <laughs> of, uh, of um, uh, trumpet. So, so let's look at Joel 2.1. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming and is at hand. So there's, there's that language. Go to verse 15 of this. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly. So when a trumpet gets blown, things start happening. All right. What does that have to do with angels? Well, let's go to the New Testament. Let's look at Matthew 24. I told you Matthew would get in on this. Matthew actually has a bunch of scriptures that line up with what we're looking at, especially chapter 24. In chapter 24, before we read verse 31, let's look at verse 30 for fun. Then the sign of, of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, 
And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they see the Son of Man coming on, on the clouds. See, there's the clouds again. Of what? Heaven, with great power and glory. That right there is key to all sorts of stuff that's in Revelation, but this is the verse I wanted you to see in this section. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Okay, so the angels, they have a voice, and there's also this sound of a trumpet going on. And, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So when angels do their uh, speak, and when, uh, especially archangels, and when um, the trumpet is blown, either here on the earth or, you know, from the temple, or, you know, God himself blows his trumpet, things start happening. Let's go to 1 uh, Corinthians. Here's the resurrection passage. Last week we were in this passage several times. We'll, 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 I think we'll touch it one or, I think we'll just touch it once tonight, but anyways. Go home and read all of 1 Corinthians 15 with what we're looking at tonight and what we looked at last night. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, uh, 52. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Hey, look at that. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. And like I said, that's where people think that that is uh, the rapture. We'll talk more about the rapture later. Now let's go to Revelations, Revelations 2, 8, 2. And I saw the, the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Huh. So when an angel blasts a trumpet, what happens? Well, read the rest of the passage. All sorts of stuff happens. Go one uh, chapter over to eleven fifteen. You also see this. And then the seventh angel sounded, so that means all seven of those angels we just read were sounding and things were happening. And there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Yeah. So when angels start doing their thing, especially the, the seven archangels, and um, the trumpets are being blown, and the trump of God's being blown, action starts happening. So the passage that we're reading it in, what, what is it talking about? It's talking about the dead coming back to life. So in one of those seven trumpets, <laughs> you know, uh, this is probably where this is going to happen. Now, a lot of people like to get into that and figure it all out, line it all up, and argue about pre, mid, and post-tribulation -trib rapture stuff. Okay, whatever. I'm, I'm not even going to touch on that because there's just so much to cover. But, yeah. Um, what was really interesting was in the, in the book of Enoch, it actually gives you all seven angels' names. They're in a, they're in a, a Jewish tradition. I was like, oh, that's cool. So I got to read their name. I was like, all right, cool. But Michael's one of them, so all right. <laughs> cool. As long as, long as one's doing what he's supposed to be doing and it lines up with the word I got in front of me right on. Okay, so the reason to not sorrow as others who have no hope back in verse 13 is that those who sleep in Jesus in verse 14 are those who are dead, the dead in Christ that will rise first at his coming, right? Coming is that good old word, uh, parousia. And, uh, and a lot's going to happen with his coming. So let's go ahead and look back. Yeah, I guess we are. We're going to make it back to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look back at the resurrection chapter. So there's a reason to not sorrow as others who have no hope. Why? Because the dead are going to be risen again and you're going to see them again and they're actually going to beat you to heaven and I'll, I'll 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 back up and give you the whole scope of this but here let's look at first corinthians 15 18 here's yeah here's more of that terminology about uh sleeping in jesus then those who have then then also those who have fallen asleep in christ have perished right so they have passed away yeah, the next verse is good because it talks about hope. In this life, only we have hope. In Christ, we are all the men of the most pitiable. Yeah, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. So, yeah, you know what? I'm going to make a mark. I might as well read the whole thing if I ever do this again. Read, read all those verses. That really helps out. 
So, what's happening? Well, we had a trumpet blow earlier. We have angel voices. They sound like a trumpet, right? And we got the dead who are going to rise again. Let's go to Revelations 14, 13. Da, 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 da. Doo -doo. All right. Forgot to mark that one. Oh, well. I found it. Then I heard the voice of heaven saying to me, Right, right, blessed are those who died in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So, the dead who have died in Christ, what are they doing right now? They're resting. You know what, I'll, I'll just go ahead and talk about some things. Last week I talked about this. I don't believe in soul sleep. I believe your spirit and your um, soul, your soul is who, who you are. If I ask you the question, who are you, and you answer, you know, that's, that's your soul. That's who you are. That's, who, that's who's talking to me. Um, your spirit is your inner man that's connected and building you. And sometimes you can see yourself argue with yourself in the Lord. And the, the righteous part of you is, <laughs> needs to win that. And then, of course, you got your flesh. Your flesh is a problem. We'll talk about the flesh another day. But the flesh ceases from living. I believe your soul and your spirit goes to be with the Lord. Who you are in your consciousness, that inner man who has been growing in you, all of that, that package goes. Where you end up, you're conscious. You know where you're at. I'll show you those verses at the end of this. Now, the dead in Christ will rise first. When I read this at a graveside, I, talk of, I say that the, the Bible's painting this picture where the soul and the spirit are going to come back to the, to the body and they're going to be brought back together, but they're going to have that supernatural body that, like Jesus has, and they're going to be in the cloud of, uh, they're going to be in the great cloud, and then we are going to be caught up. We're actually going to see this. If I knew the Lord was coming, I'd probably run to the cemetery just to watch this happen. You know, <laughs> this would be cool. You know, <laughs> so, anyways, um, I, I think things that I probably shouldn't share, but anyways. Um, that's what, that's what I believe is, is happening and is going to happen. More on that as we go. And, it is, and this is believed to be the first resurrection. Now, the Bible talks about two different resurrections. Let me clue you in on something, and the Bible does too. You want to be part of the first one. All right, Revelations 25 says, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years was finished, this is the first resurrection. So this is the believer's resurrection. So you definitely want to be part of that. And to me, that gives more evidence to the whole discussion of a rapture. Some people don't believe in it. That's all right. But maybe they'll be pleasantly surprised. All right. So let's go into verse 17. Then those who are alive and remain, that's us right now, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. All right. So we who are alive, are alive. Uh, Mounts agrees with that. It's, it's a part of so simple as present and active. Well, that makes sense. It's those who are living right now. And remain. Our Mounts puts remains behind, uh, behind, and I know why he does that, because it's a part of simple. It's present, but it's also passive. Now, this is cool. Well, it's kind of dreary, but it will get good. <laughs> we who remain, right? We, in, a, in a funeral, we say we are those who are survived by, right? And my mom's like, yeah, you feel like you're surviving. <laughs> Emotions going through. I'm alive, but I don't feel like it, you know? So, um, yeah, that's happened to us. We've, saw, we've seen our loved ones go. That, that, that's come upon us. Now, this is cool. We'll be caught up. That's how Mounts puts it. Or the King James, they use the good old word shall. Shall is a powerful word. Shall be caught up. Now this word is a verb. It's future, but it's also passive. That means it's happening to you. That means something is going to snatch you up with force. That's what that word means. We're going to get into that in a minute. <laughs> Moving on. And then at the end of this verse, uh, thus we shall always be, or we will be, is how Mounts puts it. And again, it's, it's, um, it's a verb, it's in the future tense, so take it like a 
take it take it like a, a promise and it's in the middle voice yeah we've definitely done it we've we've got ourselves there we're in christ amen moving on then then the word then at the very beginning of this shows a sequence and the alive and the remaining are those who are physically alive at the coming of the lord back in verse 15 so you guys see that it's a sequence then what we who are alive and remain shall be that's the next thing that's going to happen right which they are caught up or snatched away by force. Now, Bruce just explains to us this is where people get the rapture, but he never talks about if he actually believes it or not, and that's fine. I totally understand why he doesn't want to touch that. But this is pretty cool. He brings this out. The Greek word we have is harpuzia, harpozo, harpozo. Yeah, I like that. That sounds better. And it and it's translated Latin, Latin as rapuria. So this is where we get the word in English, rapture. Now, this word is used in different places in the New Testament. I'm going to show you a spiritual cool spot where this word gets used. But it also means, you know, like at the end of, you know, in the middle of Acts where Paul's getting beaten and the Roman guard comes and grabs him. They use that word. They snatch them with force. They get them out of that crowd, right? Because they could tell the crowd's about to beat them, and they want to know what he did wrong. So they're not going to let him kill him. And, of course, that saves his life. But here's a, here's a cool thing. This is Philip. Everything man dreams up of God can do. We, we dream about Star Trek and transportation. Well, here you go. Check out what God's already done. Uh, uh, Acts 8, 39. Now when, it, now when they came out of the... Oops, eight, nine. Now they came out of the water. Oh, yeah, so this is the, yeah. Now when he came out of the water, this is the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. When he came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. See, caught away? <laughs> There's the word. So that the eunuch uh, saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. God was just doing all sorts of tele teleport ministry with uh, Philip in this passage. It's pretty cool. Read it sometime. So, it also means when, um, yeah, there was the Roman guard. He came and, and pu pulled Paul out of there. And uh, there's about five other places where it's, it's used. So, they were on my mind and they went away. So, oh well. Here we go. Now, here's the clouds. Okay. Some people think, oh, it's just describing him going up into the clouds that are already in the atmosphere. He's coming between them or something. No, not those clouds. Those are not the clouds they're talking about. The clouds, and again, church, we can go all over the, the, the Bible with this one, but we'll hit like seven verses. <laughs> the clouds could be the same glory that the glory God was seen in in the Old Testament in Exodus. So now we're going to go real old school. We're going to go all the way back to the Pentateuch, to the Torah. Here we go. And uh, um, Exodus 19, 16, it says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning there was, a, there was thundering and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a trumpet. Hey, there's that word again. How does God sound when he talks? Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, get your attention. Yeah, yeah. And was very loud, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Yeah, I would too. All right, sounds like a pretty loud blast. All right, so, but what's going on there? There's clouds. Okay, let's go to Exodus 24. 15 through 18. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud, hey, look at that, covered the mountain. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called Moses out from the midst of the cloud. And in the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. All right, so 
the cloud, right? So when the law was being written, the cloud of glory was shining. All right, let's go to 40 of Exodus. By this time, I was already running out of tabs, so I stopped marking things. So I got to find it myself, too. All right. 40, 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of the meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, I could have kept on going. What was, what was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness by day? A cloud. And by night, it was fire. Yeah. So... This is obviously, to me, I agree, it's the glory cloud. What did we just read? The cloud filled the tabernacle. Well, what about the very first temple being built? Yeah, it filled it too. In 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11, it says, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place, and the cloud, there it is, filled the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not uh, continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. In the Pentecostal charismatic realm, we call this the Shekinah glory. And there has been services where the glory cloud has filled the place. So, and uh, some people are probably thinking, well, some people probably f fake that with a, a, a smog a fog machine. Yeah, there, there has been churches that have done that. <laughs> but there has been meetings where it supernaturally started raining inside. <laughs> So I, I, could, I could talk about that stuff all day long. God is supernatural. Do you guys believe it? I hope so. You're in a Pentecostal church. All right. So the Shekinah glory shows up. Of course, the scholar didn't touch that, and I don't blame him. All right. And also in the New Testament Im imagery of, of him, and I just put this, coming and going in other theo, theo, the, theophilies. <laughs> I can't say it. I got myself to say it earlier, and I can't say it now. It means appearance of, of, of God. Theo's God. Yeah. Ophimines. Yeah. Theophanes. Theophany is plural and then singular. Yeah. So, anyways, I was going to help you guys sound like you've been to Bible college, but even I don't remember that part. I can't say it. <laughs> so, before we get to the New Testament, I did say New Testament, but we'll start with Daniel because Daniel is talking about this. So, here we go. All right, Daniel, where'd you go? I know you're in here. There you are. My tabs worked out. All right, 7, uh, 13. This is Daniel talking about stuff that you see lining up in Revelation. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, the one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. By the way, that lines up with uh, what Jesus was saying in Matthew 24. He was, And he came to the Ancient of Days, and he brought near him, and, and they brought... They brought him near before him. All right. So, so you see the Lord coming in what? The clouds. Is it that the glory cloud? Yeah, that's how I take it. Let's start. Let's let's go to Mark. And again, you could read Matthew twenty-four, and you see all this stuff. But, but I'll show you some things in Mark. Now, Mark 9 is interesting. I'll, I'll point something out to you as we go through it that, that will that'll be relevant later. So if we stop, stop at verse 1, And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. So you're like, well, what's that about? Well, you keep reading on. The verse we're going to go to is the transfiguration. All right? But there was a saying, and, and the scholar brought this out, that the, the New Testament church, and you, if you really study the writings, you see this, the people who were alive while the letters were being written were anticipating that they were going to see the day we're describing. They thought they were, they were going to be the ones to see this. They had no idea that this was going to go on for another 2,000 years. So Jesus says this, so some people think, well... Okay, um, John, the apostle, he's going to be the one who's going to live to see this, and the church present in his day. No, they all went on too. So anyways, but if you read this, it's obvious it's the same uh, passage as the Transfiguration. So let's stop at 9. And now as they came down from the mountain, he could, oh yeah, that's not where I wanted. 
I wanted seven. Oops. Yeah. And the cloud, there it is, came and overshadowed them. And the voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Okay. It was seven. I did write that right. Good. Okay. So, yeah. What's going on here? Transfiguration. So, when Jesus is coming, or when Jesus was here and just kind of transported to his glory. <laughs> yeah, coming and going. That's why I put that. In uh, 1326, then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. This lines up with uh, Matthew 24 stuff. Yeah, it's Jesus coming back. How's he coming back? In the cloud of glory. Moving on, let's go to 16... 62, and I think, I think I messed that one up, or did I? Yeah, it's supposed to be 1462. Yeah, so I need, a, I need to fix that. That's 1462. So go to 1462. Now, just as, this is Jesus talking. Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the, of the power, coming with the clouds of heaven. So this is where he's talking to the, the chief priests and all them, and they are they're about to uh, get him crucified. So, yeah. And they ask him, who are you? And he finally tells them. All right. Now, let's go to Acts. And like I said, church, I can keep on going with this. We could, we could have done this all evening, just going to the cloud passages. So, here we go. Acts 9, and we'll look at 11. 9, now when he had spoke these things, they watched, and he was taken up. What way did he go up? Up. Yeah. He was taken up, and a cloud received him. Out of their sight. He went into a glory cloud in it. Yeah. Now we go to 11. We've read this. Here's the angels talking to him. <laughs> Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing, gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner. Okay, in like manner. Like in the cloud. Yeah, he'll come in a cloud as you saw him go into heaven. All right, it didn't say up into heaven in the last part. It said into. I'll talk more about that. Now let's go to Revelation, and I'll start making some pretty cool points here. Revelation. We'll be done with the cloud thing for, for a bit. <laughs> I'm going to come back around and show you something that the scholar didn't touch on, but he kind of hinted on, and I went with it. All right. Revelations 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the cloud, right? With clouds. And every eye will see him, and, every, and, and even they who pierced him, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And then Jesus starts talking, I am the Alpha and the Omega, right? So, when Jesus shows up and he gets here, or if he's here and he goes ahead and, and, and he's transfigured, or he ascends back to his father. What's going on? There's a cloud. There's a glory cloud. And what is he saying now in the passages that we're in? He's coming back in what? A cloud. It's the glory cloud. All right. The air could be above or below. Bruce just throws that in there because some people argue, well, is he going into heaven? And it's kind of, uh, you know, the cloud uh, uh, shows up on the, on, the on the horizon line and they just go into it. Or is it up? Well, Scripture's been saying up. And then, and then the scholar goes on and he argues about, well, some people, if you're, if you're transi transitioning from one thing to another, you could say that when you go into heaven, that's up when it's really into something. Okay, that's cool. All right. Argue about that. Have a cup of coffee and act like Christians as you do. All right. Talk about it then. But this could be explained if one believes in spiritual dimensions or realms. <laughs> it could be that he went up and out into the realm of heaven. And Paul was caught up. Yeah, there, there's the other rapture. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. 
he does talk about that. That's where that uh, rapture word is used. Uh, and so it could be another dimension. It could be another realm. It could be God is all around you in another dimension. It's just you can't see it until he reveals himself to you, however he wants to, or the angels. That's one way to look at this. Now, here's something comforting for everyone who's had a loved one who passed away. I, like, I love throwing this one in here. Let's go to a Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. What was uh, chapter 11 all about in Hebrews? Was the, uh, was the faithful people who went on. Yeah. Let us lay aside every weight, that, uh, every weight of sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Why? Because God and everyone who's with him is watching. Now, here's another thing that some people would argue with your pastor about on his theology, and that's fine. It's a free country. Knock yourself out. I believe that every person who's passed on is in Christ. They can see. They can, so if you're, if you're in God, you know everything because God knows everything that's going on. Therefore, you can see what's going on. Why should we run this race and do it well? Because all the Old Testament, New Testament, and my father's watching you. <laughs> and Dick Cottle. <laughs> and other people like him. All right? Yeah, yeah. So that's why Mel didn't buy a motorcycle. He bought a red truck. Because he knew Linda was watching. So, yeah. He, he told that story years ago. I thought it was funny. But, yeah, it's, it's very possible. They know everything we're doing. So why should we run this race well? Because... Of course, God knows what you're doing, <laughs> but so does your family <laughs> and the saints before you. So anyways, if they're in another realm or dimension, yeah, it's, it's, it could be like them just looking, in, looking out a window, watching you. I mean, it could be something simple as that, you know, but you don't see them, but they see you. So anyways, that's a fun, fun thought to play with. Now, Paul explains that being out of the body, and this is, this is the verses I've been wanting to get to, is to be present with the Lord. All right, so this is where my theology kicks in. I believe you're conscious. If you're in Christ and you died, your loved ones know what you're up to, and you know where you're at. In 2 Corinthians 5.8, it says, We are, we are confident, yes, uh, uh, well-pleasing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So if you're absent from your body, where are you? You're present from the Lord. Sounds like you know what's going on. Sounds like you're conscious. Now, some days in ministry, I totally feel Paul when he tells the Philippians this. <laughs> to depart would be great, but to stick around would be beneficial for you. <laughs> but I'd rather depart. <laughs> Verse uh, uh, chapter 123, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having the desire to depart to be with Christ. So if you depart from your body, where are you? With Christ. Yeah. Which is far better. I agree. <laughs> Some days that would be far better. Yeah. I don't have to deal with my stinking flesh anymore. <laughs> Working with my soul, who doesn't want to do what the Lord wants me to do, and my spirit's going, yes, we're going to do this. <laughs> this third of me saying we're going to do this, and the other two thirds like, no, no, we're not. I don't want to. All right. Anyways, read Romans seven at the end. <laughs> You'll see Paul <laughs> hash that out in words. All right. So thus we shall always be with the Lord means to be where the Lord is, and the people of God who preceded those who are alive and remain. You guys agree? I totally agree. That's that's where I'm at with it. So. Anyone who's died in Christ, they're there. So let me go ahead and paint the picture for you, what I believe the Bible's doing here, and then we'll finish up with the last verse and call this good. The dead in Christ are with him, right? So they're there in that realm, in that third heaven, in the seventh heaven, whatever. Wherever God is, they're there, all right? Could be a whole other dimension, whatever. They're there. Where's their body? It's in the ground or it's scattered around somewhere, you know. 
I got a, I have an aunt who she saw scattered across the lake. <laughs> so cool, right on. So wherever the body is, God's going to pull that all back together. He knows where every molecule's at, all right? He's going to pull it all back together. He's going to re, uh, rejuvenate. That's the word I'm going to use. It's probably a better word. Revitalize the body. He's going to make it that glory body. The soul and the spirit is going to connect with it, and they're going to be, they're going to come out of the grave, and they're going to go right into that glory cloud, whether it's up or over or wherever, all right? All of us who are alive and remain, we're going to see that. And then one of those seven blows of the trumpet is going to be that one where we're going to hear it, and we're going to be changed, and we're going to catch up to them. And we will be with them always. And that's the hope that we have, that we don't sorrow like others who have no hope, back in verse 13. Amen? That's how I take this. Other people take it different. That's fine. Some people think that your soul just sleeps with your body. Whatever. <laughs> Paul said to be present with the Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It sounds like to me you're awake. All right. So, with all that said, and at a, and a, and, and at a graveside, I always read this and I always say, this is my prayer for you guys here. All right. This is my prayer for anyone who's ever lost someone. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, and I always add, and I do find these words comforting. Or you can use the word encouraging that Mounts likes. It's a verb, it's present, it's active, it's in, and it's in the imperative. So he's telling you, comfort people with what? The word of God. What does the word of God say? It says some comforting things. <laughs> yeah, comforting is what Christians do for each other. If you don't believe me, look at 511. Therefore, comfort each other. And edify one another just as you are doing. Again, the Thessalonian church is doing awesome. They are actually doing the stuff they're supposed to be doing. And this is given by the authority of Paul. Who's Paul? He's an apostle. Therefore, that is the word of God. Look at back at verse 15. For we say to you by the word of the Lord. Well, who's writing this? Paul. He, he's hearing from God. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the day of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So... Yes. Should we be comforted by the Bible? Absolutely. That's the Christian thing to do. All right. So with the people on the Internet, I'll leave you with that. Be comforted with the Word of God. If you're ever down, read the Word of God. Amen? Amen.